So, welcome to a Christmas edition. <laughs> oh, no, Christmas decoration. <laughs> of all Christmas music. <laughs> of the Keen on Yoga podcast coming to you from Bali. We're still in Bali. And uh, today it's just me and Teresa. Well, not just me and Teresa. Teresa's never been on the podcast before, so say hello. Hello, first time. And, um, you know, um, I suppose we haven't done that many. Uh, well, we've never done a chat together. And um, still not that many of me uh, speaking about you know our past with the podcast and our background is like where do we come from i think someone a couple of years ago said well you know you just kind of come from from nowhere and now you're everywhere or something along those lines i think it was meant to be meant to be a compliment i think but <laughs> i think you know i do seem to be everywhere these days and i just so i just thought you know if you don't know anything about us me and Teresa, then it might be a nice time to relax um with uh with your mons wine and, and mince pies well if you're english and uh, <laughs> or wherever you are and 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 uh, let us entertain you which is uh <laughs> what i try and do <laughs> but anyway um the christmas message or introduction is um christmas is hard um the whole point of the civil war and the start of the bhagavad gita is that attachments uh create conflict that we're attached and we're conflicted with uh different interests and and different wishes uh towards each other and uh, and it's tough. Uh, and uh, so if you're ha not having an easy Christmas, don't be surprised and uh, don't think you're on your own. You're not on your own. Um, I've had many difficult Christmases <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and some some good ones as well, of course. But nevertheless, you know, uh, let it be as it is. Don't judge it. Try not to judge other people. And ultimately, you know, you probably wish the people well. So, uh, you know, don't think too much about it, perhaps, you know. Um, and the next one can always be better. And exactly. And always think, you know, like it'll always be better. At some point, this will be finished and something better will be there again. You know, I always, often think that, you know, having been, <laughs> well, having been a suffer, suffer of depression all my life on and off, that, um, you know, there will always be uh, a, a time when things are better again, you know, because sometimes it can just seem that nothing is ever going to get any better. And you just have to try and keep that in your mind that, you know, Things change all the time. It's the nature of life that it's in flux and it changes. But also, there's people having a lovely time as well. Yeah, and um, not to be a downer if you're having a great time. <laughs> hey, keep having that time. Keep that. <laughs> keep that fire rolling, and, uh, and 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 you know, no. But um, really, um, let's make a start before we get ourselves in deeper water. Um, so thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm kind of excited to be doing this with Teresa. Um, we've been. Uh, Married almost ten years now. Apparently, it'll be our wedding anniversary, our ten-year wedding anniversary, when? next next year sometime. <laughs> sometime in September. I know the rough date is nineteenth, or is that right? Something around then. And twenty-first. <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> I'll take another guess later. Um, anyway, we've been married almost ten years. I think we've been together almost twenty years, um, and okay. longer than twenty years. We met in two thousand and seven. That's ridiculous. No, that's not 20 years. It'd be 2027. Then. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Edit that out. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, we, no, that, that's, uh, you know, that's recompense then. Well, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. Um, so, uh, and we thought, you know, we'll just do a little back and forth interview today on uh, interviewing us both so you knew a little bit more about my background and uh, a little bit more about Teresa because Teresa is, uh, you know, she never likes to go in the spotlight. So it's quite unusual to get her on today and uh, and talking. Well, let's see how, how she does talk, how it goes. Uh, all right. So I suppose we'll start with me. And I, I think you've got some questions that I wrote. I wrote I wrote the questions in the first place. So I can't. It's more of a natural. Well, it is natural because I can't remember them. So ask me, ask me, ask me a question. What is your background story with Ashtanga practice and teaching? Background story with practice and teaching. Um, well, I suppose that I started Ashtanga around 2000. I was at university and um, I was suffering, you know, I was suffering depression, anxiety, a lot of anxiety, actually. Um, I didn't really feel like I had a, a stable foundation in my life as a lot of young people didn't. Um, and I wasn't really happy with the way things were going academically for me, you know, like, I didn't really agree with the academic path that I was taking. I was studying philosophy, as a lot of you probably know, and you can probably imagine from my posts. Um, so I thought there's something I have to do in the body. I remembered I did martial arts when I was young, and I felt good with that. And I kind of stopped doing all, all physical exercise, really, you know, as you do when you're 
in that in that kind of age um and i thought you know this needs to get back to something so i started with hatha yoga and i did hatha yoga for about a year at university it was a one of those university societies so that you know part of the the, the yoga society was at the time uh, and i really liked it. it as soon as i went to practice i i really felt like the cliche of coming home i thought this is exactly exactly what i need is the only thing that really relaxed me apart from copious amounts of alcohol um and uh yeah, I, I got into it straight away. I practiced straight uh, straight away the next day, and every day I maintained that practice. And then fast forward a year, I find Ashtanga Yoga. Um, just randomly, it happened to be taught in my town by a teacher. Uh, he wasn't going to Mysore. So my background, I suppose, to cut a long story short, was kind of Ashtanga, but not exactly traditional. Like, he didn't say the prayer. He didn't really talk about Mysore and Patabi Joyce. It was the series, but with a lot of handstands and kind of extra. So it was kind of exciting, but I suppose my background was more um less mice or mice or and more more kind of freestyle really yeah what was his name it's called mark free i should I, yeah, i've got to get him on the podcast really um but can i just say i think at that time that's how it was because a lot of people didn't know the strict my mice or regime in fact it wasn't even in place yeah i i, I think there was i don't know whether it was that much taken up then really i think the people weren't that I don't want to say interested, but I don't think there was, you know, most people just kind of didn't have that background with it, really. They didn't have that interest to I'll go to Mysore or, you know, they would drop into a class a few times a week. It's just a bit casual, though, I think, you know. Um, yeah. But I think even Mysore at itself that time wasn't didn't have so many rules. Yeah, maybe there was that as yeah. well. And, and there were so few teachers and so little, uh, like, media communication that I think. Yeah, and I yeah. yeah, I didn't sense the kind of rigidity that has crept in in the past years there, and you were kind of encouraged to do what you could and, and carry on, and, and, you know, the way it was taught, like I walked into my first Ashtanga's class, did the full primary series on the first class, yeah. and muddled my way through, and, you know, because obviously after five, you know, you can't get into the posture when you don't know it, after five breaths, you're stuck, so you're kind of like always one behind, and, you know, it's a mess, and you just kind of gradually catch up like that, really, and you're just kind of encouraged at that time, I mean, for good or for bad. You know, there wasn't this old oh, stop here. You haven't got that posture right. And then all different teachers would come and show you different things. And the you know, David Swenson videos were kind of, you know, people would use the videos and copy the practice from there because there was no teachers to teach you. And it wasn't a centralized. I suppose you could say there wasn't a kind of centralized control as there is now more. You know, Batabi Joyce was one authority, but I think there were a lot of other kind of Western authorities out there as well that people would kind of weigh up. Yeah. But I don't know that they put themselves forward so much as an authority either. No, but I think there's like, more influences right yeah. now. I think it's just not because everyone can get to Mysore more and that's more obvious and, and, and around. It's like, that's the, that's the authority more, I think. Mm, you know, mm, more. Yeah. Whereas it wasn't then because people could maybe only knew John Scott or only knew Richard Freeman. And then it'd be like, well, oh, where's this thing about Mysore? You know? And I think they each had a kind of different take on it, depending on when they went to Mysore. Yeah, yeah, you know, and there was that as well. Yeah. There just wasn't the information around to so have a kind of a centralized kind of this is the way it is, yeah. and also a centralized narrative that it's always been this way, that you have to do it this way to be traditional Ashtanga. Because, yeah, traditional Ashtanga depending on what teacher you went to. Mm. Really, you know? Yeah, and you could go to, yeah. sorry, this is got veering from your question. Oh, but you, you like could, the question, so I'm happy to keep you talking. You could go yeah. to a different teacher and, like, it would be taught completely, not completely differently, but a lot differently. Yeah. And well, you kind of think, oh, that's. But what, not necessarily what I learned with the other teacher, but it didn't really matter by the same token. It was just like... Yeah, I guess it was kind of more naive and more open in a way with the yoga background, that there wasn't such a history of built up kind of ideas and expectations around the practice. It was almost just like a more happy, oh, you found some yoga. You know, it's just like kind of like, wow, this is new. This is exciting. And it was yeah. the only fast yoga. Yeah. The only there, fast Yeah, there was, no there was no vinyasa, vinyasa flow. flow or I mean, exist. Bikram really wasn't around either, really, was it? I mean, it was around, but, you know, it just wasn't, you know, prevalent hot yoga or Bikram Oh, yoga. you wouldn't have heard was it, it prevalent? there was no internet. Yeah. Yeah. There's that, and then there's only the sheets, you know, so you have the sheets, the John Scott line drawings, and then you could kind of make your own. It's really like it wasn't like a also a homogenized ideal of a posture so much because I think there were the charts, but no one really had the charts so much. You know, the Lino Mele or the Shirat chart. Wind Not hanging chart. on the wall. Not hanging on no. the wall. They'd only have that generally, that one of, um, what's that guy? Uh, um, Dharma Mitra. That, yes. that was popular, the Dharma Meet chart, uh, chart, but but not the the Surat ones or the Patabi Joyce. So so they'd have the John Scott line drawings, and then at that but, time, yeah, you also had to photocopy them. 
Yeah, there so, was no computer, yeah, so you, there was no like email or printing. Because you couldn't really <laughs> see so much what the posture was meant to look like. So I think there was a lot more freedom yeah. around the expression of the posture. It's not yeah. like now you can look on YouTube and see Kino's posture and go, well, that's what Trick and Arsenal should look like. I must make it like that. Yeah. I think at the time it was just like, well, this is the shape that I can see in those lines on a black and white photocopy. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember when, when I did it and I thought that, Mary Chesna D was the same as B because I just didn't think D was like within the realm of yeah, possibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, it must be a mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I that, thought that. that yeah, exist. Yeah, exactly. I thought yeah. that Sony apostles. That yeah. just that can't be. Yeah, it's the same. <laughs> Jenny I remember just thinking that's not right, and probably isn't. <laughs> if you think about the knee position, well, for many people. Anyway, it's a side subject. How did I get into teaching? Just to finish that off. Um, well, I started working as a cook. Um, well, I finished university and I really didn't want to go down that path. So I got into cooking because it seemed kind of more fun and a bit more embodied or dynamic and social. Um, and then, you know, after cooking, I kind of supported my way around uh, with the cooking and uh, doing some yoga teaching on the side and traveling around uh, cooking and different yoga centers. There were a few of them and uh, learning like one of them is Yoga Plus in Crete. That was a really famous one. Derek Island, a very famous yoga teacher who taught John Scott and Alex Medin and Petri Petri hey. Raisin, Hamish. And then many people went through that center. So I cooked there a number of times. I learned from Rada and Pierre who were running it after Derek's, uh, well, Rada was running it before with Derek. But anyway, um, and uh, yeah, I was traveling around and then, uh, you know, in the end, I traveled to Purple Valley and that's where I met Teresa. She was she was running Purple Valley and she employed me. And that's how we met there. So, uh, yeah, at that time, I suppose, gradually my cooking phased out and the yoga became you know a bigger part of my life um, just because I was really involved in, in the yoga. And, and, you know, also it was easier to teach yoga than to cook 12 hours in the kitchen and uh, do these kind of shifts in the kitchen. So so one thing had to go, I suppose, you're either doing split shifts in the kitchen or you're going to be a yoga teacher. You, it's hard to do the two things together. If anyone's worked as a cook, you'll know what I mean. You know, getting home at 1am and then getting home, getting to practice at 6 is kind of uh, not sustainable for the long term. Even though I was, you know, we're talking when I was 20, I was, you know, doing this between 20, 20 and 27, I suppose, you know, until I met Teresa at, well, I was 27 then, almost 20 years ago. Not quite, apparently um all right okay so moving on otherwise we'll never get through these questions okay, okay. what were you doing before covid right <laughs> why, why do you laugh at that just because it's the next question. oh right just because it's the next question okay <laughs> so um my presentation oh, pretty, you're right you're right <laughs> okay <laughs> um what was i doing before covid so I was, you know, just what, what we were all doing, um, teaching a Mysore. I was a Mysore teacher. I'd been a Mysore teacher in London for over 10 years. We'd traveled around a bit after we met. Um, I'd worked in Turkey for a while in Istanbul, teaching a Mysore there. I, in fact, I started Mysore classes in Istanbul. There were, no one had done a Mysore in, in Istanbul before me. It's my claim to fame. Um, and then I, you know, after a few months I left there and then we went different places together, Teresa and me, cause Teresa had finished Purple Valley as well. Um, I was in Istanbul mainly on my own. And then Teresa came over and said, why don't we go to Vancouver? She's Canadian. If you haven't heard already speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so we went to Vancouver, uh, which is fantastic. Um, we were on Victoria Island for a, uh, a while and then back. Oh yeah. Victoria on Vancouver Island been a while and and then in vancouver itself um and we run a little uh, mysore studio there we had a, a loft flat and if you can imagine we slept in the mezzanine and then the bottom floor we converted everything took it everything out and just had it as a yoga studio so we did that for uh, a yeah. year or two we were, we were there for, for two years. years some of it i yeah couldn't work at all well, i probably wasn't going to be working then either was i no. anyway <laughs> we'll put that under the carpet um and uh, yeah so we're there and uh yeah, we did a few extra things. We tried to start off a, a yoga center in Tarifa in the south of Spain for a while. That didn't didn't end up working well because it was too far away from the airport. And so logistics scuppered us there. And we brought a few people there, though. Mark Darby, uh, Nancy Gilgoff came there. Um, yeah, so it was, you know, something. And then in the end, basically, cut a long story short, we come back to the UK um, and... Um, I started in Mysore. Yeah, but that's when we started going to Mysore. Yeah, and then we, well, we've Went been to, to Mysore, Mysore before <laughs> when we were running Purple Valley. But yes, in, in all earnestness, let's say, in all seriousness, then when we, we, one reason to come back to the UK is because we could get to India and go to Mysore more easily from the UK. And that's when I started continuously to go to Mysore to get the authorization. I mean, you know, it's not that I believe, I, I didn't feel like I was on, I needed the authorization necessarily, but I just sort of felt like I was fed up with everyone 
all the authorized teachers at that time kind of it was a time when you know if you weren't authorized all the authorized teachers would kind of take shots at you oh you shouldn't be teaching and not authorized it was, it was a big thing it was just annoying so yeah, yeah. so oh I mean, you know wasn't and we had a connection with we had a connection we'd hosted Shirat. Teresa had hosted Shirat a few times in, in purple valley and i'd spoken to him a lot there because the groups are small there i mean this was when Shirat was a uh, still just Shirat because patabi joyce was alive so you know he wasn't the head and and people treated him differently and he you know, he, he was in a different role, so responded differently. So you could have a really informal chat one-to-one -one for an hour on the terrace in Purple Valley if you wanted, you know. So we had a relationship with him. And, you know, it's not like I went to Mysore just to get authorized. We went because that was that was where I was at, right? At that, that yeah. point with, with the study of Ashtanga. You Ashtanga. were teaching and it was... I was teaching. Yeah, it was, you know, you want... Well, yeah, a lot of things. Developmental. You, you know, yeah, I mean, a lot of things like, you need, you know, it's useful. I'm, I'm you know, I wouldn't have had it any other way. You know, yeah. you learned the vinyasa proper you know so you know what to what it is there and then you know how you'd want to teach it in reference to there or in con you know but you i think it's good to know the way that it's in inverted commas traditionally done so you know then what you want to change and modify in terms of the way you teach it rather than not knowing exactly the way it's done there you know mm. uh, you know and if you can't go well that's fine but you know you know we had the opportunity to go and basically Teresa was working a normal job so that was the fluke or the luck of me being able to go really because you couldn't I couldn't have gone on a Mysore uh, teacher wage uh, Teresa just happened to work a proper job you know so she was able to afford us to, to go three months a year for a number of years to Mysore um, and yeah I mean that was that was really so so grateful for, for her affording us that opportunity and, and um yeah. And so I think it has to be said, as always in the, in this situation, is that Mysore is a luxury and uh, yeah, uh, fortunate to go. But yeah, if you can't go, then, you know, I'm certainly not saying you ought to go either. Um, was that what, what where was the question? Oh, oh right. You doing but, right okay, so you yeah. were teaching in London. Yeah, right, basically. Yeah. Bottom line, you know, you go cut, in cutting, the city of London. cut to the chase. I was teaching yeah. in the financial district, the yeah. city of London. Um, and well, first of all, I was teaching at the same centre, but a different location slightly. Well, that's not interesting, is it? But anyways, <laughs> we ended up teaching there for many years and going to Mysore for three months a year and coming back. And and uh, and we had a good group at the time because there weren't that many yoga centres really in London and certainly none in the city of London. So it'd be up to like four, 50 people almost at some, in the Mysore in the morning. Yeah, 50, 60 yeah, people. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, and yeah, and there wasn't so much other yogas around. You know, Anusara was still, if you remember Anusara, that was still on the cards as the main contender, really. There wasn't so much vinyasa and hot and all the different things. It was still more, you know, we're talking probably, yeah, 2010 onwards, probably 2010 to 2000. And yeah, maybe yeah. a bit before, something like that. Yeah. 2009. Yeah. Yeah. It was more or less 10 years I was doing that and doing the classic thing of teaching, getting up at stupid hours in the morning and practicing then and then going in to teach at six. And then you have this whole day doing you know when you just kind of off you know and it's uh, I was in the office. yeah Teresa was in the office I'd and just yeah I'd go to bed you know I'd like prepare some easy. some food for her uh, for her dinner and then just go to bed it was a tedious life in many ways and I wouldn't recommend it um and for some reason I didn't really do I should have done loads of stuff on YouTube and I can do all the postures so well then and <laughs> I and uh, you know and I would explain some tutorials like La Ruga I should have done all that stuff but I didn't I just didn't do anything really it's wasting my time and we were told, like, the sort of line in Mysore was... Don't do anything, don't, yeah. Don't do on your website. Don't, uh, like, no yeah, social media. That's true. Laruga, Laruga was totally out there in doing that stuff. Because, yeah, 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 Kino did it. and then But Laruga also at the time when... Told when, you to get on Instagram. Yeah, and we were like, yeah, when other people weren't doing that stuff. And it was seen to be, like, all the people in Mysore would say, oh, what are you, you know, yeah, oh, what are you doing? And No photos in the shalas. You weren't supposed to take photos in the shalas. It was the whole thing was that I think the there was a lot of yeah. There's a lot of peer, I think there's a lot of peer pressure to keep quiet, really. I think as well. Yes. And there's only I mean now only like the recent years when I had the courage to just start putting things out there because I just thought, well, I don't really care anymore what people are going to say. I just think I have stuff to say, and and whatever they say in my so that's well, a, doing it in my so yeah. Well, obviously, obviously now it's yeah yeah yeah. Them. But first of all, you have to have a bit of courage to, to step over the line that most people don't yeah, want to step over. But now I think it's less and less. Yeah, I, are, but I think that's the time of yeah. COVID, though, because I think before that it was still a watershed time when there was yeah. less of this out there. And then, yeah, I mean, so before COVID, I really was just doing that normal Mysore thing, really. And, and But I'd had Mark Darby as a teacher. So in certain respects, yes, and in certain respects, no, because Darby teaches not in the way that is 
in a more technical. technical way than it is done in Mysore. So I was still kind of a bit of an outlier. I mean, people used to say in, in Mysore, are you doing a Yengar yoga? You know, I mean, not that it was alignment based, but there, there, there was a particular tension to technique that might not have been found in the way it was taught then in Mysore. Yeah, yeah. because authorized teachers weren't supposed to or allowed to do workshops Allow, at that time. Well, allowed to participate in workshops. They weren't allowed to teach them for yeah. a while. It was... That was the thing, like that you weren't supposed to teach. You had yeah. to have your own shala. Yeah, there wasn't so much of that around. I mean, I suppose Richard Freeman was the main person that people would go to to learn technique, wasn't he? He was really, you really had the, yeah, he was an outsider. He really had the dibs on uh, on uh, and technique altogether in Ashtanga. So things have changed, and yeah, I mean, COVID did change everything. And in many ways, it's such a good a good thing for people just to have a lot more. It was just a lot more opening up of the whole Ashtanga thing, and and freer, and uh, you know, more sharing of information. And uh, in some respects, I would suggest Ashtanga has become more homogenous or rigid in, in its interpretation. But in other respects, it's expanded the other way, you know, that, that people are, like myself and others have, have really kind of expanded outwards from the blueprint and said, well, you know, this is the ideal. Um, but let's see what we can, how we can make this inclusive and relevant for, for everybody, for all bodies to practice, understanding that it was formulated, you know, undeniably around a young teenage body you know and, and uh you know if anyone you know, wants to argue that i mean look at if you're practicing when you were 20 like me and now you're 45 it's you know it's a different thing so you know if you want to practice for a lifetime you like the ashtanga then you know in the end you're going to have to go well do i stick to be super traditional or am i going to make this work for myself you know yeah. okay hearing from the oh, question okay well i'm done that that no how did doing. you start an online presence and the podcast right well you know i mean basically because of you <laughs> well, you put the question down. <laughs> well, do you want to answer that? You can you can explain that because I've said that so many times. I said you had to teach online Mysore. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I was working at a um, the same yoga center, but in a different capacity. I was organizing the um, therapy hire rooms. And so I had an ear to what was going on in the yoga center. And as they were closing down, like the days coming up to... Um, the lockdown for COVID and they were sort of going online and I just said to Adam you have to go online because I just I didn't even know how it was going to be but I, it was quite scary at the time it's hard to remember now but uh, I just knew that all the students it would be good for them even to meet up on on video like because it was yeah. such a shock one day to the next if no one was seeing each other I didn't have a plan I just wanted to keep open as long as possible and then you were I, just saying no, 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 and then I just said you have to do it. Yeah, because at the time I was still of the mind that you couldn't teach; you had to teach with the physical adjustments. So, I mean, going on to a later question, you know, that's really one thing that's changed greatly for me is uh, seeing how you can teach tango online has changed my my whole approach to the teaching of it. And I thought I was out there before, but but now I would say, yeah, I, I have a completely different approach, having just taught online. But yeah, I was reluctant, as you know, I often am to most uh, suggestions of changing anything i'm a little bit uh well i'm taurian as a star sign so i'm gonna be stubborn and uh and resist change let's say um so difficult to work with um but you know when i get my teeth into something like i i you know uh, after the first day i came off i remember i said i loved it to you right i said oh yeah, yeah I, I loved it i said it's like being a racing car driver or something you know there's all these people on the screen and you you're looking at it on his I was doing it on a cell phone first of all yeah 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 like all the how many people do we have like oh like 15 I mean you're switching because yeah maybe you have different screens you swipe the screen swipe the screen yeah yeah but it, it became a bit difficult looking at, yeah and when it no <laughs> yeah but you know also just looking at some people on the screen just gave you a different angle on their practice because you look at them more objectively not as a person anymore so, as such but as an image and look at them to get clear instruction rather than the same you know working with people in proxy you know in person you don't have so much objectivity in a way but that was great i mean in many respects the the covid time obviously was uh you know a break for many people and a reset and and uh, perspective and time to look again um and yeah, I mean, do I answer the podcast one as well at the same time? Um, is that is that does that go? And what about the podcast? <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the podcast was also your idea. <laughs> um, yeah, most things have been Teresa's idea, to be honest, and I just carry them through. In fact, what Teresa has a speciality of doing is suggesting an idea and then just saying no. After a while, just saying no, no, don't do it because I I get the idea and I'll be like, first of all. I don't think so. And then as soon as I think, yes, let's do it, then it involves you having to do stuff or 
And then she's like, no, actually, I'm not sure about that. And then I was like, yes. Then so anyways, so we did the podcast because I remember walking there, having this walk and, you know, you go for walks, long walks in the COVID times right around the streets. They're kind of empty. And, you know, we were having this walk and one day and she said, you know, like we know all these people because um, we hosted people at Purple Valley, obviously, Teresa around Purple Valley and had all these contacts. You'd invite different teachers. So we, we kind of had those. And people, had been in MySore. Had those, yeah, connections. And, and in MySore, you know, what I did in MySore was, um, you know, to look it's kind of boring in my soul right like you know after the morning's practice and okay you got a bit enchanting for me not that interesting either um but what i did was i would cook i would learn the skill so i would cook these lunches for people so i would get all the mexicans a bit racist really but I'd get all the mexicans around and cook them uh, mexican food and all the italians around like and cook them italian food and it was fun you know it was just really fun and so we'd meet a lot of people like that because i didn't know people in my first of all because we were like like newcomers really on a, on a scene where people have been coming for years. I mean, we went in 2007, I think, and then we didn't go back that much, you know? So then when we come back in, you know, later on, it was like these, all these people have been going. And so, you know, to, to meet people and to get to know people, the cooking was a real ice break, you know, so I'd almost walk up to people after practice and, and having kind of seen them somewhere, you know, I'd know who they were. I'd say, Oh, you so-and-so. Oh, Okay, do you want to come? It's a bit silly, really. Do you want to come around for lunch? And, and you know, and maybe they would think, well, who is this guy? But yeah, everyone wanted everyone, we're happy everyone wanted a lunch. Everyone wanted a proper lunch at that time because they were in the Western cafes, and I was cooking Western food, and I was quite, you know, a good cook. You know, yeah. so if you wanted Western food, like, and and you know, we made some great food. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, Mexican food was, you know, it's, yeah, Italian food was good. I mean, you know, anyway, so we did that. So we had these connections. Um, so when I suggested to, you know, to people to do a podcast and obviously it was COVID times and everyone was like at home as well. So, you know, you could catch anyone. So, you know, you'd, you'd DM Eddie Stern or, or DM LaRuga or, you know, all the bigger, you know, Mark Roberts and they'd all say yes, you know, and I'd have a, you know, I know a lot of these people I wouldn't know well. I mean, my teacher, Mark Darby, I was new better and certain people, Harmony knew better. She but was the first. She was the first. Yeah. You know, some people I knew better. Some people I didn't know at all. Yeah. Um, but yeah, everyone was eager to do it. And I couldn't believe how many people said yes. Uh, everyone said yes. And so few people said no. So, you know, it was just, just flowed, you know, it just flowed. And I had this friend, basically a student before COVID who was practicing in person with me, who worked, um, he was a sound engineer basically for Sony. So, uh, or well, not sound engineer, but he did, uh, there's more than that. <laughs> he's, in <laughs> he's, he's in music and uh, not a sound, you know, high end, you know, like, uh, but um, he works for Sony in Japan now. Anyway, so it was lucky. And he just basically helped me with the podcast because I don't know anything about technology. So, uh, yeah, I would just record them on zoom, I think at the start and, and then I would send them over to him or he would get them somehow and he would, yeah, he would convert them. And yeah, um, up to this day, our sound quality has not always been the greatest, I know. But uh, yeah, it, they were easy to do and easy to record. And they just, yeah, it just, just worked. And just having people there and a sense of community and everyone was kind of locked up at home and, and seeing the people again that we hadn't seen, it was... Mm, yeah, it was... It was, you know, looking back at that time, it's a kind of a, yeah, it's an evocative time. And then from there, we started doing the Kim Yoga workshops because online workshops, I mean, that was just, rat. I mean, again, Teresa's idea, none of it was my idea. Um, and uh, that worked as well because people had time on their hands and yeah. uh, they would meet, you know, their students from all over the world that they hadn't seen. And yeah, it just, they just, you know, we'd get 170 and 180 in a workshop for Mark Roberts, you know, I mean, it was just, yeah, crazy, crazy times. But uh, so we have just lucky. A yeah. lot to to thanks for COVID. Yeah, you know, I mean, for us, you know, I have to say it, it works well because I was in a place with the yoga centers where there were more and more yoga centers in person, not in person, but more and more yoga centers opening up around my yoga center in the center of London, and uh, it was becoming increasingly difficult to get students in the Mysore. My numbers were down. My yoga center hadn't really upgraded their facilities where other newer swanky yoga centers had come in and were giving offering free porridge for yeah, breakfast. free breakfast stuff with you like porridge. Well, you know. <laughs> Um, and, you know, showers where my yoga center yeah. didn't really have good, you know, yeah, whatever. But, you know, it, it, so for me, it was a struggle luck because I was down on my luck having, you know, not, uh, not, not the numbers I used to. And, uh, yeah, it just, it suddenly came. I didn't expect it would, but, you know, it just, it just really opened up a, a new, our lives. and yeah, yeah. And you, and, and then we're here now because other than that, I would have probably been still London tied to Daily Mice or not that it. I felt tied to it. I enjoyed it. But, you know, when you're teaching in person, obviously you've got to be there every day. Now we've been in France for a couple of years and now we're in Bali and well, soon we'll be in Australia for a month. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think I've got to ask you some questions. Is that right? Okay. 
Right. Okay. <laughs> so uh, first of all, I mean, I mentioned you're doing a, a proper job to support SMI. So what was your background? So I worked in corporate events. I was a corporate event organizer for a European, well, American restaurant chain. Um, what was that? <laughs> Hard Rock Cafe. Hey. And so I worked in the corporate office. Um, nothing to do with the actual burgers. burgers. You weren't making the burgers. <laughs> Luckily. Yeah. So that's why it was sort of where I have my uh, skill set. My skill set yeah. from, and you know that just sort of always worked with with how I am. Um, and I had done a little bit of Ashtanga um, before that, but when I had that job, it just took over my life. And when I came to my 40th birthday, I just thought like, that's it, enough of this. I need to get back to that yoga that I'd had a taste of. So I booked a, uh, yoga retreat with Mark Darby over Christmas, um, at Purple Valley in Goa. And while I was there, I found that it was for sale. The retreat was for sale. The woman who had set it up, um, just, had had enough of running it. She'd ran it for a year and a half. And so I thought that my friend Hernan might be interested. Um, I brought the details to him in an envelope because it was like before the days of email and stuff like that. And he was interested. So long story short, he ended up buying it. I ended up becoming director. Um, I committed for three years and I did that job for three years. Um, Yeah. And in that time, that's when I started the daily practice. So sort of like by that point, I was 41 when I started. And yeah, it was, you know, in a way, an incredible experience because I was hosting all these teachers like, well, Sharat, David Swenson, Nancy Gilgoff, la la la. But I sort of was first learning. I had a big job on my hands and Mm. I had a different teacher every two weeks. So it was Mm. kind of like, and you'd really started learning when you were 40. I, I mean, I never really reflected on that coming to yoga when I was like I don't think 20. So. Yeah. I was like, why are, they, why, why, are you str- why are you struggling with Kapatasana? I was like, you know, I just didn't have that perspective okay. until, you know, until you I get was older. Sort of not much younger than you when I started. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you know, and I came along and I just thought, I, I can't believe she's just running this center on her own in India. Um, all these teachers and all these staff and... Uh, it was just crazy that she was doing it all on her own. Um, so yeah, we became friends, and um, also she likes she likes to eat, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, and you know, we 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 bonded over love of food, and then you know we actually did a load of stuff with food as well. Remember, we had the the cooking blog, we had the oh yeah Keen's Kitchen, yeah. Um, so we did a lot of you know, uh, cooking stuff together. And we'd go around and uh, you know and, and, and try different things, and the same with Purple Valley, we'd we'd find different kitchen equipment and different uh, ways to do things and make our own tofu and. Yeah, so we've really done a lot of that over the years. So I think there's one thing that we really enjoyed and, and probably kept us together is the the shared love of experimenting with food, really. And and you know, for a long time, it was like, well, yeah, it was also we were into vegan diet, um, not now, but you know, we used to try and you know, when it was you know really particularly popular in Vancouver around the 2007, we went to the library, we'd go to the library and get the vegan books out and try and make like vegan cheese and and vegan mayonnaise and all these different, you know, all the it was just really new then. And so we're just being excited doing this stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, Teresa's, you know, probably, you're probably the only vegetarian that worked at Hard Rock Cafe. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. But she's a staunch vegetarian. Um, uh, vegetarian, but I was sort of, it was like a party lifestyle. And I was, you know, partaking, you know, you'd go down to the pub quite often, as is the case in London. Our offices were in Hyde Park Corner. And there was like a nice pub underneath. Well, nice. Um, but yeah, that would be the after work thing. And like many times, many beers, <laughs> cigarettes, all that stuff. Yeah. And when I started yoga, so that job, actually, I came back to, I was running Purple Valley simultaneously, not yeah, because somewhat simultaneously. I, I was yeah, doing, and then like, you do that in the summers. Yeah, contract job there in the summer, um, organizing concerts in Hyde Park. And yeah, so once I started the Purple Valley, I stopped the party lifestyle, which they actually in that job were, were okay with. You know, they didn't sort of force me to drink or anything like that. <laughs> Sometimes there's a big pressure in corporate jobs. And yeah, I mean they were very flexible and yeah, they allowed and, and, and no, I never had a I never had a proper job. Um and and 
yeah no but they allowed you to go and calm a lot you know we had a lot of flexibility we'd go to Mysore for a few months and you'd do a little bit of work there for them but mainly you know like we'd say they were allowed you know it's really thanks to hard rock cafe really in the burgers that i'm here today yeah. which is the irony of it actually is that yeah they were very very good and, and supported us well through Teresa obviously working hard for them but you know did support us really um yeah we should we should get them on as a sponsor maybe yeah. maybe the sponsors up to this day but um yeah and, and then at a certain point things changed and and uh and you didn't work for hard rock cafe and then what were you doing i mean what i want to say is what were you doing before the the uh the covid, COVID. outbreak yeah yeah so yeah after hard rock we had a little stint in crete and that's <laughs> oh yeah the, we had a little uh, tried to do a yoga center in crete as well and that didn't work out so i mean i think if you know it's easy to be in this position listening to the podcast think oh you know oh everything's worked out for them and it's like well you know it's working at the moment but you know we've had many you know and it won't work in the future i think like everyone else you know you saw ups and downs and we had many abor yes. aborted missions and and many things that really you know we, we we sunk a lot of time effort and money into that 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 really bombed <laughs> a lot of other teachers yeah, that yeah, since yeah. we've met people and been talking to them we find out that yeah we're not alone in that everyone will say that won't they you, yeah. you know if you do anything successful you have to have like 100 failures before one yeah. success and, or if you do anything uh, yeah at all. and we definitely had a lot of uh a no quite a number of failures yeah yeah a couple a few we had a shop as well an organic shop oh, yeah. you remember that that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> keen's 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 organics yeah yeah we ran it as a mom and pups organic shop yeah well, when, we, when we got the accountant, he asked us why we were doing that. Like when I told him my job, he was just like, don't do the shop. Don't do the shop. Anyway. Who said that? Keith. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. We should have listened to it. So that didn't work. And I mean, Teresa basically wanted to get out of the, the, the corporate life because it's still stressful. I mean, you know, they, they were good to her, but, you know, it's still a long, Eventually long. Eventually it was like. It was not like, too long. So in mean, the cut long story short, she wanted to get out and, uh, I we did, ended up working at the light center, which but was the same really center teaching oh, in, the, in the capacity of like they had three centers. So I was the manager of renting out the therapy rooms. They had like 27 therapy rooms that they rented out in like two slots a day. So that was my role. It's a that. busy job. And I don't think you like that that much either. Do you? That was kind of unique about it at the time. And it was like a at least a full year before COVID was that it was home based and nobody I knew worked at home. And we only had a meeting like once a month. So I'd gone from this corporate job that was full on every day. I mean, it was a fun, fun job, though, because the people were fun in it. It wasn't like, you know, working for a bank or something like everyone wore jeans and it was fun to this thing of being at home for the whole time. And like, yeah, working from home, it was it was it was I think, really, yeah, that I mean, really, I think you struggle with working your own ever since really haven't you you know kind of like just being on your own working rather than working with a team mm -hmm. i think it's been a yes, main, I really yeah. liked working with a team yeah and now you just time. ever since that time you've just yeah. from the light center working your own to doing this and really you know i mean she's with me obviously but a lot of the time i think she'd rather be on your own yeah. um and uh you know but you really you're working on your own again because i mean you know Teresa does all the back end stuff all the stuff on the website all the stuff with booking systems and the podcast and the editing the podcast all that stuff and i don't know anything and i have no interest in it um so yeah you're still on your own there really with that yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so that was what i was doing was that at the light center right and yeah and now now this that's the end of my question that's the end of your question so <laughs> right so do, do i have any more I think I wrote some. I think I wrote some more for me. Yeah. <laughs> but, also, we've been jumping around a bit. Oh, we have. I mean, yeah. try to be spontaneous, you know. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, you know, we, we I think we could definitely do another one on you maybe next time. No. <laughs> well, that's, okay. Well, I'm well. Just, I don't, you know, it's always me, me talking. That's, that's what people say anyway. Yeah. Ask, ask me another question. But um, this time I'm allowed to. It, yeah. I don't actually like being in the front. So then the next one we've actually pretty much covered, I think, is what did you learn from teaching online? Okay, no, I don't think we have. I mean, you know, in a way, um, seeing people more objectively because when you're close up to them, there's many things going on about human proximity. But I think also for the person. I mean, what I have really loved is the autonomy of the individual to sculpt, to formulate, to 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 figure out and decide on their own practice. Whereas when you're, you know, you can try to do this in person in a room, but when you're standing over someone giving them a suggestion, there's not many people who are going to just not do it, you know, and some people will, but a lot of people will feel, you know, as I would have, feel, um, you know, the pressure 
to do what you say. And the beauty of the online thing is that, that you know, you're in your own house, the, the students that are they're logging on, they're, you know, a long way from me. And I think, you know, and I always say, look, I'll say different things and take it or leave it. You know, you don't have to do it. So it's just like you've got all these possibilities, but you're really like the architect finally to take care of your own practice. Um, and I think that's just really freeing to, to allow for that kind of autonomy for the for the student, which, I, you know, I don't know why, but I, I really like that, that I'm, you know, I, I'm not the I'm not that kind of teacher who wants to who wants to tell people what to do. You know, I'd much rather people figure it out themselves with my with different different possibilities given to them. Um, and then, it, you know, the onus is really on the individual, because that's the, the, the journey of yoga is to try and take responsibility for for what you're doing and not in the end look to the teacher to tell you how it should be or what to do. So, you know, it's really, you know, in many ways, the online format is a really mature kind of yoga practice, actually, where as much people might say, oh, you know, online, it's, you know, you don't get the adjustments and you don't get the spirit of the room. And well, that's true in a way. But on the other hand, it really makes you take charge of yourself and self-motivate. And yeah, and then you're on your own as well in your own home. So potentially you might be more relaxed than in a yoga center surrounded by people when you have that sense of, well, someone's doing that over there. Why shouldn't I do that? Or, you know. And also it was never initially meant or, you know, it wasn't the thing to have a teacher 365 days a year. It's like people would go to India, practice. A couple months and then come back and practice on their own because there was no teachers. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's self-practice because there just literally were no teachers. Yeah. I remember John saying that to me when we, when we met in 2000, he said, you know, go to India for a couple months and then like 10 months a year, I'm on my own practicing. And that's the way it was. That's Weird it, to think yeah. now. But I mean, you know, so the Mysore style, you know, in, in person, it's a bit of a strange phenomenon in a way that, you know, that people would go every day to do that and then be adjusted by the teacher quite strongly every day. I just don't think that works for many people, especially those that most of the people that come to a Mysore class, then going on to do a normal job and have a family and they're being, you know, it's not sustainable, you know, to, to have that kind of mentality, you know, and have that kind of uh, pressure on you every day to do that up to that level in, in a, in a in-person Mysore class. So I think, you know, the sustainability is much greater online as well, where you can take it at your own pace. You don't have that sense of competition. You don't have these strong adjustments by, from the teacher. Um, and yeah, and the other thing is the adjustment thing, you know, as I step back, as other teachers, a few other teachers who I won't name will also agree as you step back from the adjustment idea and you look again and you think, well, actually, Adjustments don't basically work, you know, I mean, like adjustments. I'm not saying physical, physical touch as a method of teaching doesn't work, but adjustments as pushing a body to what they can't do by your force. That's just dangerous. And that's just passive stretching. That's stretching your ligaments and your joints. And it's, uh, you know, it's not a precedent that I would want to continue over a long period. You know, I mean, I don't think I injured anyone, but, you know, Probably, you know, it's impossible almost not to if you'll keep pushing on people every day like that. So anyways. Um, at yeah, the I, same time, can I yeah. suggest that? Um, also from teaching online, you have now, when you do t teach in person on retreats and stuff, you enjoy that more too. I love teaching. Yeah. I love so teaching. Kind of like like, helped yeah. with both. Uh, no, I mean, I, I love teaching and in person teaching again and much more fresh to meeting the people from meeting online. And uh, yeah. Um, fantastic. Yeah, but I, you know, I mean, I, and I, now you meet them like they're not all just from one city; they're like from all everywhere. around the world, everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's given me a renewed vigor for teaching in person as well because I've become more skilled yeah. at what I'm doing by looking online. You know, in a, in a much more thorough way than I ever was, I think, in the classroom for some reason because you can see everyone at once, so you can, you know, it just it, it's a good training actually working online to getting clear about how you would suggest things are things are most efficiently done or, or looking at different bodies, doing different things and say, and seeing the variance there as well. So and, yeah, yeah. I, I ultimately, I think, you know, it's made me a better teacher of in person. Um, but if I was ever non pushy in my adjustments, I say I probably, you know, I'm less pushy in the adjustments now. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, I, I suppose I approach the, the old Ashtanga adjustments in a slightly different, different way than, uh, than I would have pre COVID let's say. Um, have I got another question or was it? Um, well, you've written them. <laughs> no, I don't remember them. That's the whole How spontaneous. Would... Yeah, yeah. How would you view yourself? Ah. <laughs> Another one about me. Um, well, that's yeah. the question to you. You know, I mean, I know I don't really feel that I'm a figurehead of the community because I always feel like I'm a slightly outside it and those people in the community are 
very much going to Mysore and, and that's, but you know, maybe that's a narrow way to look at it. Um, I still have respect for Mysore. I've always thought and encouraged people to go and see what it's like for themselves and see what they think of it and whether they resonate with it. I had a great time. I learned a lot. I mean, you, you know, to be fair, you don't learn how to practice yoga, you know, in, in, in technical, in a technical sense, you know, you don't get that kind of teaching in Mysore, but you know, you get a teaching, you know, um, there is a method and a teaching that you do pick up and you get, you know, you do get something intangible about going, or at least that's my experience. So, you know, I recommend people to go, would I go again? Probably my time is over. You know, it's like many things just like have a great time, but would you go back to secondary school again now? No, you know, that, that, that kind of period has been done. I'll never say never, but you know, um, I probably, you know, I don't look currently to going back to, to, uh, to study again in Mysore. And so therefore I, I suppose I do feel a bit of an outlier in what I'm doing now. And people will suggest, Oh, you know, you're not, you're not traditional Ashtanga anymore because you're, you're not, you know, you're not rigid about how to, you know, you must stick to the sequence and you can't do this unless you can do this. And you suggest people can go on if they can't, you know, but I think, you know what, that was always the way it was orig originally taught. And that's what I really yeah, learned. Now that yeah. some people don't even realize, like when I was talking to someone on the last retreat, like I was in Mysore for three years, three months each time. And because I couldn't stand up from backbend, like I was just on primary, which is fine. But I was in a room with like Kino and like I was the worst one in the room for the whole entire time. But I think some people don't even realize how strict that that policy is, and that yeah, and that letting letting people progress is is a is a I mean, I think that's, thing. <laughs> I think that's one thing that reason I started. You know, I really wanted to start the podcast and interview older teachers because it's been different things over the years, and I think it started in a more, you know, a slightly more free spirit. And obviously, when numbers came became too much then rules had to become more stringent to to pre prevent chaos and all people coming and doing different things it's like well okay it has to be done like this now you know but um originally it was it was more free-spirited and uh there was a, an allowance of different bodies more or uh, you know definitely a, a kind of understanding that the practice was more individual based i mean my style means in individual based yoga in the first place so i think it become you know when when the huge numbers came to my it obviously had to become more um homogenized in its approach just just so everyone was on the same program you couldn't you couldn't say okay that person should do this that person should do this yeah. but yeah but also the funny thing is is that like so everyone in our because we were in the first batch because he was like very advanced and because i was with him and i knew Sharat, so we were in that very first batch which was like all the advanced people right who, who were the teachers like the main teachers who now you know by name and the thing is, what they do is they think that the teaching is like how they're taught in Mysore, but that's like advanced teachers and they try and teach the students well, also, the exact same way, like students at home who have a job. And I think also a bit, a bit, yeah, <laughs> but ability is blinding as well. If you have that natural ability, then you also kind of don't find it easy necessarily to put your your yourself in a position, having always had that generally, mm. that, that you that people don't have that that um that they have obstructions they, they don't have that capacity so yeah but it's kind of a shame because some of the people we knew that like were there and dedicated and loved it and like would then go home and try and set up uh you know teaching and they couldn't keep students because they were like being really rigid and sort of applying what they learned in the first batch in Mysore to like people off the street and just doing a daily job and just yeah. want, you know not having the same aims or expectations towards the practice as well that they just wanted to come in move and breathe a bit mm. but then they'd be stopped at sun salutations because they couldn't you know yeah. they couldn't complete so-called com perfect or complete those adequately to the teachers so they're like a 20 minute practice when yeah. they go to some some mice or studios stopped yeah it's a and shame also, and yeah because it wasn't like that before even when we started like yeah we'd go all the way through and yeah, well, when David and Nancy famously first went to Mysore and they, you know, they were kind of allowed to do things not perfectly and given, you know, a whole bunch of postures. And the lead classes were, like, you should do one like that one day, like where it's Give just like jumping through between a Group, whole Groups set. of postures, yeah. Yeah. So things have evolved. Not, and, even yeah, yeah. not even not jumping through between left and right, like just one jump through after the end of marriage. That's mm, how it was mm. when I learned. Yeah, yeah. Do all the marriage, then jump through. Not like left, right, left, right, left. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you could do a whole practice even at a kind of basic level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. We well, lost a track. Well, what was the question? Oh, well, that leads into mm -hmm. 
what changes would you still like to see in the teaching ah, practice of Ashtanga? It's a good little segue. Um, <laughs> well, what changes would I like to see? I mean, I think I'd like to see people being more, still more expansive in their viewpoint, more inclusive, uh, more kind to students, realizing that, you know, it's overwhelming in the first place to put yourself in the position often, uh, going through it on your own and being in a room of advanced people and just being a bit more tolerant, kind and understanding in their presentation of it, really. And that, you know, they've got a real individual with emotions, and difficulties and life challenges you know in front of them who you know they don't know what they're feeling and uh yeah just trying to just help in any way rather than restrict often it seems the other way around like you know you can't do this you can't do this you know rather than in encourage and motivate where it's safe rather than kind of almost restrict and restrain i think you know so i would like to see i still think that shang could be phrased you know the method could be phrased within the bounds of encouragement rather than the method uh of ashtanga being often defined by its rules you know i don't think i'd really like to see you move out of the method of ashtanga being defined as the one with all the rules you have to do it this way exactly mm. you have to do you know i, mean, I think ashtangas are defined by the method of the tristana as patavi joyce said you know it's posture bandha and drishti and how that creates the the breathing you know that's the fourth element to it so it's an inner method and the postures are just coat hangers to understand this inner method. So they've been moved around. You know, the advanced series was changed in the 1980s and, and the four series were created out of two. Um, standing postures have been moved around. Things that, like Teresa said, have been the groups of postures were jumped back. Uh, you know, things have been changed. It's not, like it's not the gospel. It's not the Holy Grail or it's not like a magic combination lock to enlightenment. So I think to take it more pragmatically as a method for yourself and for your own exploration. And rather than, you know, dwell on the postures and they're perfecting. Or like yeah. well-known original teachers who had done like all, what, four series, but did sun salutations or like up dog with the legs on the floor. Yeah, that was taught like that, first of all. They were taught with the legs on the floor and upward dog. And yeah, I mean, you know, so yeah, I mean, just to be less litigious about it, maybe. And, and also to teach who's in front of you. Like there's a certain point when you can teach my sort the my sort my sort start to students, but those are few and far between really. I mean, I remember my class in, in the city of London, there'd be like two or three people who my sort my sort style was applicable to. And the rest of the people I was teaching modified Ashtanga according to what I thought would, was their level and their needs, you know, mm. and making it enjoyable to them and effective. I mean, it's like, um for you know function over form rather than the other way around all too often it's like the form is everything and the you know and function almost doesn't matter rather than you know how is this actually helpful rather than like have we got this posture right in the eyes of the great god of ashtanga you know and just be a bit more creative with it and make it fun a bit fun yeah. without making it silly like it, make it, it a bit more light-hearted in a certain respects it used yeah. to be and theoretically that if that's traditional like the more historical so yeah yeah that should be then so yeah there's many things I, I suppose i'd like to like to change about it really but um, maybe you should apply for the job the head of the ashtanga tradition <laughs> me yeah let's see let me see i'll put it in my cv let's see what he says um but you know i mean other than that though i mean or, or uh, leaving that aside you know i still think that it's great that you know i mean i'm still pro mysore pro uh that lineage you know whatever you know we're going to call that however long that's gone on you know, I still like the idea of a figurehead and a centre uh, of authority, and I still think there's a use for that. But I think that against that, you always have the outliers who always expand the boundaries as well. The two things uh, there's a there's a, uh, a name for this, uh, like a centrifugal and centripetal effect. You have to have both. You know, um, and I'm not exactly pulling against authority, but you have one centre point and you expand outwards from there. Um, and I think yeah, oh, there's 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 room for both really. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So I think it comes back to asking you another quick yeah, set of questions. And if someone have covered, okay. Have we covered them? Um, um, oh, we've said the most challenging thing about your work. You said basically it's your loneliness. Being you, alone. Just not working. Because yeah, you're yeah. always, yeah. well not, but you've got the online, all those oh, things. Taken up, yeah, with people. And Teresa doesn't see the people so much. So if you yeah. want to reach out to Teresa, please DM her. <laughs> but, please. <laughs> Um, because she's lo she's lonely here. Especially um, wants to talk about makeup or hair. Yeah, yeah. Everything non yoga related. Talks to Teresa. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, she's just saddled with me all the time, and uh, uh, you know, and I'm just, I'm, you know, as you might imagine, I'm kind of, you know, I'm still very, very interested in yoga after all these years. So you know, I mean, it's like, yeah, philosophy. yeah, yoga philosophy, and yeah, and writing the posts. You know, you know, it's always always writing these posts, and I think that was a question, wasn't it? I wrote yeah, to you how one more how how do you get um 
how do you get inspired to write all the posts? Yeah, but I think I have. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. I'm you know, I'm jumping the gun. Right. So the final thing I'm going to ask you is, um, what would you like to develop? Well, that ties into yeah. the other. Yeah, it's like okay, two things because a we've been traveling now. Well, we were in France for two years doing during COVID. Yeah. So first of all, there was the year working at home alone. Then two years of COVID and living in France. So no, like meeting people or talking to them because they don't speak French and yeah, had the COVID restrictions. And now we've been traveling for two years. So that's like a long time. I haven't been connecting with people. So I guess what I would like to develop or what we would like to develop is, yeah, like a base somewhere where we actually have so some more connections. Yeah. Yeah. The teaching in person. Yeah. We more, do have a lot. We have more coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Retreats, like yeah. Seeing more people and, and yeah. Yeah. Connecting to the people. Yeah. Yeah. It's not say it's not fair to say you don't speak French. You speak some words of French. Say some French. Croissant. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't understand that. <laughs> oh no, j'ai un retour. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns, you know, um, as uh, she mentioned, she loves a bit of shopping and uh, tends to return more stuff than she actually buys. So that was a big part of your, yeah, doing returns by uh, what was it? What was the the postal system there? Uncoli, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah no, yeah. that's Je Uncoli. Yeah, <laughs> I, have a, I have a, I have a collection. <laughs> I have a parcel. That was another one. Yeah, I have a parcel. Yeah, I am, a, I am a return. <laughs> you might have said that. I think it's quite possible. <laughs> I have, I am, I am a return. I am a return. Yeah, the best thing was yeah. when they had the collection boxes, so you didn't have to say anything. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, you practiced your French a great deal. Like um. Yes. Yeah, so develop that. Would develop, be like, develop I, connections, real people. And uh, yeah. yeah, we've been traveling around too much now. It was never really a plan, but, you know, we got out of London during COVID time. We thought we'd go to France and check it out. Um, and it was, you know, France is just incredible country. No, no regrets there. Wonderful country. Just difficult to run a business from. Um, and a yeah, the Fre- business, yeah, yeah, and the French language is difficult for Teresa. Obviously, I'm fluent. Um, you couldn't order croissant either. Sometimes they have trouble oh, understanding it. Do so, Sometimes the English accent gets in the way of the French accent, let's say. And if you're speaking with a nice English accent, um, yeah, they didn't understand. Um, but uh, anyway. nevertheless, we loved it there. But um, yeah, we've been on the move. Then we came to Asia. Then we've been traveling around. It's uh, been amazing. It's been a great, it's you know, a, pri- a privileged opportunity, I must say. But uh, planning more to spend time in Europe and more around uh, teaching in person and maybe finding somewhere to run more things in one place yeah. um yeah or at least a couple places yeah yeah yeah, yeah. more steady more steady uh, routine yeah, yeah yeah that will be the plan so uh you have a last question for me is that i what? have four more oh my you. god just just quickly um well, the pick the best one find inspiration for your posts uh, it just comes out of me it does i see just comes process. out i don't know how it happens i mean it's like sometimes we chat yeah you know often i just i I mean it's still constantly thinking i just honestly that's been probably the thing i find easiest and still i mean i might probably change tomorrow now i said that but you know just sit down and i often i just have ideas i suppose i've been teaching a long time and that seen lots of things so that helps and i just have that kind of mind i suppose i was always frustrated after quitting academia that i had some wish to 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 study and write Mm -hmm. and, and express my express myself um yeah, so you know, it's just, I really, really, I mean, I really enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. So. And you can do it anywhere, as witnessed in Sephora. Or- I can write in yeah. Sephora whilst Teresa's looking for makeup. I can write in almost the noisier place that it may, more it makes me focus, actually. Yeah, so uh, I can uh, write and do write uh, at all times of the day, any place. Yeah. So who has inspired your journey the most? um mark darby uh i always credit mark darby as my main teacher although i'm not sure he'd be happy <laughs> <laughs> he's a hard taskmaster if he's listening um but you know a wonderful teacher um and uh, the only person that could get through to me because i'm very stubborn um and he did and uh for, for that i'll be forever grateful i mean he taught me the inner method of ashtanga that i never understood uh from my saw or from previous teachers although i'm sure people like john scott or richard freeman were talking about it to me they couldn't get through in the way that darby did because he's just like a sledgehammer sometimes yeah well not you know hard but yeah um yeah uh, and not in the face um but you know that he he just is a great teacher if you ever get a chance to, to study with mark darby or see his videos 
I recommend it. He's just such an inspiration for me and still an inspiration now at 75, I think, or roughly around there. And, uh, and still in, in great, you know, a great testament to the uh, efficacy and health of the practice. So, uh, yeah, he is my inspiration. And, yeah, I mean, you know, and Shrat, I have to say, was an inspiration for me for many years as well, of course. Uh, you know, he was. So those two people are inspiration. Obviously, you as well um, has been uh, an inspiration for, for all my life since I've met you. So um, maybe we'll, on that cheer, uh, are, we, are we done? No, we have one more question. Oh, we have, oh I think we'll round it up there. Um, okay, ask me the last one. You must know. What's your guilty pleasure? Oh. <laughs> I have too many. Uh, well. And you can't say chocolate. You no. Know, um, I say you that. You the answer. You made the question. Or, well, that's what do you think it is? Don't say that. Um, um, no, like, oh, reading philosophy. Reading yoga philosophy somewhere. Oh, yes. On a the, holiday or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell you what it is. Tell you, like, like trees are like take trees are taken care of in the shops. She's looking around the shops. I get a croissant and a, and a black coffee, and I, and I can sit in a cafe reading Foucault, Foucault, or or some existentialist for hours. That would be an indulgent, I think, and guilty pleasure of a refined nature. But yeah, that that would be it. And then, days. what would your unrefined guilty pleasure be? Like, no, that's my guilty pleasure. That's yeah. just it. Oh yeah. Nothing like Emily in Paris. Or oh yeah, I like I like the, the crown. No, the crown's not that good. But I, Emily in Paris is good. I like yeah. that. Yeah, Emily in Paris. Or or what was that other one we used to like? That was a bit. Uh, there's another kind of. Um, oh, what was it? There's one, there's one that we like. Oh, the um um Lupin. Lupin was really good. Yeah, that's uh yeah. on the Netflix, the French uh, uh crime. Uh, uh, series so yeah now and again watch something like that but yeah that's really it like um 20 minutes oh so that's my inspiration i make guilty pleasure you got you know to both of them really inspiration. yeah oh yeah. No, inspiration was yeah yeah all the teacher front um uh, yeah my guilty pleasure what is it shopping i do, see now you i'm not like that i'm not i <laughs> i i like to go to the shops but be, mainly because talk chatting chatting about no i'm just normal with that it's just you don't chat yeah well, I'm... I know it's small talk that well. What what is it then? Maybe Sephora because we're traveling and that's the only and thing pizza. I can fit. You like pizza? Pizza, yeah. Pizza and Sephora that would be a good night out because I can only fit like small things All into right. my suitcase. Yeah, I don't shop that much. I just <laughs> just because we're traveling all around. <laughs> uh, what a place to end it. Do we have anything else to end it on apart from other than shopping? Uh, other than, uh, oh, well, that's where you always oh, end up. Right on okay. the guilty pleasure. Okay, well. Um, I hope you've enjoyed somewhat listening to us ramble on um, and some of it may be intelligible and some of it may be random and unrelated, but um, I hope the sentiment has been there and we, you know, we really just feel like hugely um, indebted to you as to listening uh, to generally to the podcast and being interested in, in what I write and, and just me as a teacher generally, it's, you know, it's been a, you know, obviously a, a, a huge, uh, gift and, and inspiration over these past years what we've been able to achieve with you and with the keen on yoga um and yeah let's let's hope we can continue you know working together and developing community and, and connections see you in person. Yeah, maybe see you in person yeah. yeah yeah next year we've got loads of dates um probably too many really but um <laughs> if i can, can complete if i can complete them yeah. um and yeah and i hope to see you there uh or online come to the mysore you're always welcome even if you drop in now and again even if you drop in once every blue moon always happy to see you you know i kind of feel that you know let's, let's take the censoriousness and the the, the 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 strictness and the heaviness out of ashtanga and just make it a bit encompassing and, and kinder and lighter now uh, whilst keeping with the method you know keeping with quality teaching so uh yeah thanks uh for sharing everything you have with me and thanks for allowing me and Teresa to share with you um so on that note, I suppose let's uh, wish you a merry uh, happy holidays, Christmas or merry holidays Christmas. or whatever you're, you know, I'll just, yeah, I'll just, you know, just taking time and, and, you know, and having a pause for reflection perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, and next year we'll be in Malaga over the over, over Christmas. We'll be in Malaga December from, 20th to the 27th new year, probably with a special guest. We're hoping we're working Not on new year, but yeah, maybe. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, lots of projects on the pipeline, working with different people and developing things. So uh, if you've got any suggestions as well, 
always happy to hear them. We, you know, we really do try and grow together. It's not just us leading this. Um, and yeah, thanks again for your support. And uh, I hope it's a great new year for you. I hope you have, you know, really positive new year, good start to the new year. And uh, yeah, happy new year. And bye for now for both of us. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> bye.